this one here, no. No, Henry, this one's just a little shot. Hold on, Dale, let's get rid of it. Construction workers building an addition to the hotel assisted in the rescue operation. But I'd seen this one woman just had a short fur coat on, ready to, had her one leg out the window, ready to jump out the window. I figured we had to get her first, and we brought her down the scaffold first. And I went up two more times after that and got more people down, but that's when the smoke got to me and I had to go, to, I went to the hospital four days. At one point I hit the button, and I, I don't know why I did it, and the door opened up and I saw two bodies inside. And there was another girl standing with me and she screamed and I just ran. It was an eerie sensation. It was like being in a tunnel. You could hear people screaming in the distance. It was just like a horror movie. You passed bodies without thinking of it. I know that I was in such intense pain. The feeling that you do not want to die with the smoke just slowly creeping around you. I went into a lot of different rooms. I was just with a bunch of people. Some were hysterical, some were calmer, some were crying, some were praying. And in a very short period of time from when I got into the hall, into the stairwell the second time, I was out. I simply don't remember going down 23 flights of stairs. I guess it was about an hour and a half of just sheer bedlam up there, not knowing where you stood. I thought that that was it. When another fireman came into the room and he said that there was a clear stairway and to follow him, and I just bolted down nine flights of stairs. And then I realized, how am I ever going to find Alan? So all I could think of was that he got stuck in the elevator. I kept thinking I saw her, you know, so I'd run over to this group and it wasn't there. And then, then I heard that uh, there were set signs and busloads of people over to the convention center. We were missing each other on the different buses when finally he spotted me. I was never so happy to see anybody in my whole life. I did not think I was coming out alive. Air Force helicopters joined Metro Police and other helicopter units to rescue victims from the roof. People from all over Las Vegas offered assistance. The Barbary Coast, located across the street from the MGM Grand, shut down casino operations and opened up an aid station. School buses responded to move survivors to the Las Vegas Convention Center. Eighty-five people died as a result of the fire at the MGM Grand. Most died from asphyxiation, the result of carbon monoxide and smoke inhalation. Many died in hallways, some in rooms or elevators, one from injuries sustained in a fall. More than 600 casualties were seen at local hospitals. Before the fire was extinguished, the Clark County Fire Department began its investigation. The National Fire Protection Association, U.S. Fire Administration, and the National Bureau of Standards and other agencies assisted. In its final report, the Clark County Fire Department concluded that the fire had started in a concealed space near a pie case in the deli restaurant. The most probable cause, an electrical ground fault. The fire smoldered for a time and broke out into the deli, where it quickly spread, feeding on combustible contents and interior finishes. When fire broke out into the casino, it fed on a massive fuel load of furniture, decorations, and gambling paraphernalia spreading the fire with such force and speed that it blew out the hotel doors and spread to the port cochere. The fire was largely confined to the casino level and brought under control by 8.30 in the morning, but it released immense quantities of highly toxic smoke. Design, construction, and maintenance factors contributed to the smoke spread to the high-rise. For example, seismic joints, open shafts designed for earthquake protection, which extended from above the casino ceiling to the top of the high-rise, spread the smoke upward, as did stairways and elevator hoistways. Smoke spread into corridors and reached air conditioning units on the roof, which were not equipped with smoke detectors to shut the systems down. The smoke was recycled back down shafts and into the corridors. It migrated into guest rooms through fan coil units and around doors. Smoke also spread up plumbing chases and bathroom vents. A number of people broke windows. In some cases, this drew smoke into the rooms. As with most fires, the smoke, not the flame, was the real killer. I just 
you know, grabbed a towel and I covered my face for the rest of the time, though I had already inhaled the smoke. Many of those who survived the MGM Grand Hotel fire had exhibited correct or adaptive behavior. For example, crawling low in smoke or breathing through a wet towel. Many survivors evacuated the building on their own using stairways. Others sought refuge in guest rooms and later were assisted from the building by firefighters using stairways. Some were rescued by fire department ladders and by helicopters. A few set examples that would have been dangerous to follow. I remember on about the 25th floor in one room there was probably at least oh, 25 or 30 sheets tied together and I looked out the window and that was so far down I thought boy they really had to be frightened to think of going out of here on that sheet. For over an hour the sound of glass never stopped. I saw a sheet of glass uh, three feet square anyway or four feet square come down and shatter on a fireman in the middle of the ladder. They didn't break out just a pane or two. They broke out the whole thing. And in some instances, they broke out the wall. The fire in the MGM Grand Hotel was a unique incident. The fire developed rapidly in a large, undivided area and spread smoke throughout the high-rise. Exit stairways, which should have assisted evacuation, filled with smoke. What should have provided safe passage became untenable. Hotel fires occur nearly every day. Most are confined to one room or one floor. However, hotel guests can take steps to protect themselves. Fire safety begins at the check-in counter. Good afternoon, ladies. Checking in. Inquire about the hotel's fire protection systems and patronize hotels that have good ones. Keep the room key readily available, always in the same place. Locate smoke detectors and intercoms. Figure out how the window opens. Windows should be broken only as a last resort since if smoke comes in, a broken window can't be closed again. Check the hallway layout. Locate fire alarms and fire exits, and count the doorways to the exit so that you can locate them. Your room may be the safest place if fire breaks out. Be alert for instructions. If you're escaping, use the stairways, never the elevators. But check the stairways for smoke before the door closes, since doors may lock behind you. Stairways may not provide access to the roof. Do not rely on helicopters for rescue. Well-marked exits, the fire sprinklers in the halls and the rooms, that's what I look for. The smoke detectors, I'm looking for exits. It just never occurred to me to see where the fire exits were. I do now. The survivors were not the only ones changed by the MGM Grand Fire. In May 1981, the Clark County Commission passed stringent new fire safety requirements retroactive to all existing structures over 55 feet. At the MGM Grand Hotel, an elaborate new fire safety system was installed with sprinklers, smoke detectors, and intercoms in every room and corridor. Nine months after the fire, the MGM Grand Hotel